Philippians chapter 1. Uh, if you have a Bible there, I would encourage you to open up and look, or it might be on the screens as well. Philippians chapter 1, it's on page 980 in those Bibles. So uh, we're going to read verses 1 to 11. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with the overseers and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, for all of you, making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ Jesus. It is right for me to feel this way about you all, because I hold you in my heart. For you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness, how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. This is the word of the Lord. Well, uh, about a mile from here is Ormo Golf Club. I don't know if anyone's a member of Ormo Golf Club. I was on their website looking at what they have to offer, and it says, the course provides a challenge for both the low and high handicapped golfer, with good shots being rewarded, and those that stray offline receiving due punishment. That sounds kind of intimidating. But they are trying to attract new members, and one of the ways they do that is by advertising the events that they put on. So they'll say we have music nights and we have quizzes and social events. That's how the golf club tries to persuade people to join. Have you ever thought about how the army persuades people to sign up? Here's what it says on their website. A sense of belonging may sound like a small thing. Sure, you could look for belonging in a, golf, in a, a football club, but the sense of belonging you'll find in the army well, that's the next level. When you've trained together side by side, learnt things no classroom can teach you, and fought with each other, for each other, that creates a bond like no other, a bond that lasts a lifetime. And so the leading question I'm going to ask you this morning is, what do you think our relationships in church should be like? Should they be like the golf club, or should they be like the army? You see, both the golf club and the army, <clears throat> they both offer community, don't they? But which version of community is most like what the Bible describes here in Philippians? Should we strive for a golf club fellowship or an army partnership? And in order to answer this question, I want to consider Philippians 1, verses 3 to 5. And I want to focus especially on one word. So Philippians 1, 3 to 5, I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Now, the word partnership there is often translated fellowship, and uh, I wonder what you think of when we mention the word fellowship. I tend to think of small groups in church you meet in someone's home uh, over tea and coffee and have a little bit of a chat maybe after the service. And do get me wrong, uh, those things are absolutely important in a church. It's good to have friendly people and a bit of banter and a cup of tea after the service. But if we have that kind of mentality or that kind of thinking when we read partnership in Philippians 1, I think we undersell what Paul's talking about here. He's not talking about a golf club mentality. A church operating like the golf club might advertise itself like this. Please join us. We are a warm and inviting community in a comfortable facility. We have a full range of activities for you and various groups for your children. 
We offer small groups and events at which you can chat to other people and get to know them. Nothing wrong with that. But a church operating on the military model might recruit people this way. Please join us. God has given you a mission that you cannot accomplish on your own. A mission that is much bigger than you and for which you need other Christians to help. Now again, both models contain elements of truth, don't they? But I'm going to argue that in Philippians, Paul is talking about that deeper partnership, almost like a military partnership, where we're fighting alongside one another and for each other. But before we think about this a little bit more, let me just pray for us. Will you join me as we pray? Our Father, I pray this morning that you would meet with us and that you would teach us through your word and through your spirit, that your spirit would give us clear thinking and understanding. Please would you help me to speak what is true and in a way that is helpful. And I pray that we would all have hearts to receive your word this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So just for a few moments, what I'd like to do is to take uh, a quick look at this relationship between Paul and the church in Philippi, uh, to see what it might show us about this partnership in the gospel. And we're going to run through these fairly quickly. There's about five of them. Firstly, the partnership between Paul and the Philippians is rooted in their experience of God's grace. Philippians chapter 1, verse 7, at the end of the verse, Paul says that all of you share in God's grace with me. When he thinks of these Philippians and thanks God for them, he, he thinks of how they have come to know God's grace and receive it in the Lord Jesus, how they've all benefited together from Jesus dying on the cross for them. He thinks of how they all together share in this citizenship in heaven that he speaks about, that they're all Christians together, but it all begins with grace. And I think in church today, we need to remember that our partnership, our fellowship together, starts there with grace, doesn't it? And the members of the golf club all come together uh, because they share a common interest in golf. Uh, they tend to come from the same kind of backgrounds, not always, but usually. They tend to come from the same kind of cultural backgrounds and educational backgrounds, but not so in the church, and even not so in the army. Here we are today by grace and grace alone. All of you share in God's grace with me. So that's the first thing. Secondly, the partnership between Paul and the Philippians features prayer for one another. One another. And Paul opens the letter and uh, he tells them that he prays for them with joy, doesn't he? And in chapter 1, verses 9 to 11, he actually writes a prayer for them. He tells them what he's praying. And if you cast your eye down to verse 19, if you've got a Bible there, he says, I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, that what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. So there's Paul in prison in Rome, and he says, I'm praying for you, and it's wonderful that you're praying for me. And this is partnership in the gospel, praying for one another. It's a two-way street. Thirdly, their partnership involves giving and receiving. And it's one of the main reasons that Paul wrote this letter. He's in prison. He doesn't have the things he needs. And so the Philippians send a guy called Epaphroditus, and he brings lots of gifts for Paul. And he brings encouragement for Paul as well. And Paul says, I'm going to send Epaphroditus back to you with this letter, the Philippian letter, to encourage you and build you up. There's a giving and receiving. In chapter 4, he says, you Philippians know that when I first went to Macedonia, there were no other churches that supported me, but you only. There's a deep partnership and love between Paul and these Philippians. He even says, I'm amply supplied of everything that I need, now that I've received from Epaphroditus the gifts that you sent. And not only gifts, but visits and news in this back and forth. They sent Epaphroditus to Rome, not just with the gifts, but with news about what was going on in Philippi. And Paul says, I'm so encouraged, I pray with joy, because I hear you're going on with the Lord. And he sends Epaphroditus back. 
he says, I'm going to send Timothy to you as well. And listen to this. He says, uh, Timothy's going to tell you how my trial goes in Rome. He's going to let you know whether I'm going to be killed or, let, or live. And then he says, in chapter 2, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, that I also may be cheered when I receive news about you. There's an expectation that Timothy's going to run backwards and forwards with this news. So even without Zoom or WhatsApp or emails, Paul knows about the Philippians and they know about him. And they pray for each other. And they love each other. Finally, partnership is all about mutual affection. This letter of the Philippians contains the most intense expressions of Paul's love for Christians. For example, in Philippians chapter 1, verse 7, he says, I have you in my heart. In verse 8, he says, God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. And then chapter 4, he starts to gush. Therefore, my brothers and sisters whom I lo love and long for, my joy and my crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, dear friends. I wonder what brings you joy. Um, at home, my wife has introduced me to Marie Kondo. Has anyone come across her? She, she likes to tidy things up in a sort of Japanese way of keeping things ordered. And when she sorts out people's houses, she says, the key question to ask is, does this thing bring you joy? You know, it's an old welly bit, no joy there, toss it in the bin. A photo of your family. Yeah, brings me great joy to keep it. And Paul says, I have in my mind this picture of my family, my church family in Philippi, and I pray with joy every time I think of them because of this deep affection between us. It's a warm, personal, tender, committed relationship. Just pause here for a minute and think, what about the relationship between the people in the golf club? Yeah, we're friends, we meet together and play golf, we have common interests, but the relationship between the guys in the army, I think that's deeper. How is it that guys in the army can come together from lots of different backgrounds, nothing in common, and yet afterwards they'll say, we would die for each other, we love each other, might not use that word, but that's what it is. How do they form these intensely committed relationships? Isn't it that they sweat and cry and bleed together? They fight alongside one another and for each other. On the army website it says, when you fought with each other for each other, it creates a bond like no other, a bond that lasts a lifetime. And partnership or fellowship as Christians here in church is about striving side by side, as Paul says, for one another in the gospel. It goes really deep. In verse, in chapter 1, verse 27, he says, whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Whether I come and see you or whether I'm absent, I will know that you stand firm in the one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel. This is gospel partnership. It's based on grace. It starts there. It involves praying for one another. It involves giving and receiving gifts and news and support. And it involves this really deep mutual affection. Imagine if churches around the world enjoyed partnerships like these. Well, in the time that remains, I just want to express my appreciation for you and for your partnership with Crosslinks and with Josh and Kathy and their children. You are gospel partners as you share in God's grace with them, as Christians, as believers. And they greatly value your prayers for what they're doing in Belfast and then hopefully in Namibia as well. Thank you for praying for the spread of the gospel here in Belfast, uh, for praying for them as they lead these courses, Christianity Explored, and as they teach people how to read the Bible. Thank you for, for praying for Namibia as well, 
the people who have become Christians there. Thank you for your generous financial support, which not only enables them to get on with the work without having to worry about that, but it's also a token of your love for them personally. And in Crosslinks, you know, people say to me, you started in September, what, what, what's your plan? <laughs> what's your priority? Uh, my response is, my priority for Crosslinks is to help churches here develop this kind of deep affection for missionaries and for missionaries to develop a deep affection for you. That you and they would say of each other, we have you in our hearts, as Paul does here. We thank God every time we remember you. That's my goal and that's my prayer for you and the missionaries you support, whether they're with Crosslinks or some other organization. And I believe that if we're going to create and develop and sustain these kind of relationships, we need to pray, don't we? We need to pray for one another. And so finally, Paul finishes with this prayer in verses 9 to 11. As typical of Paul, it's a fairly complex sentence, and uh, we're not going to go into it in too much depth. But he is praying with the last day in mind. Do you notice that? He's praying ultimately in verse 11 for God's glory. And he says in verse 10, he's praying that we might be pure and blameless until the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ. He's saying that ultimately what matters is that day when Jesus comes in glory. And ultimately what matters is that we're found pure and blameless in Jesus. And don't we know that that's true because that's what we want for all of our friends and our family and our loved ones and the people around us here in Belfast, that we might be ready for the day of Jesus. So we pray for each other as Paul does with that in mind, aiming for that day. And he says in verse 10, we pray that we might discern what is best, that we might remember that that is what is most important because there's lots of things we can do, but he says we're getting people ready for that day. And so verse 9, he says, this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight. Do you remember the day when somebody came up to Jesus and said, what is the most important commandment? What did Jesus say? It's interesting that Paul here defines the most important thing in the Christian life is growing in love, love for God and love for one another. Wouldn't it be a brilliant prayer to pray for our mission partners, for Josh and Kathy and for all the other missionaries that you support in this church, that they would know God more deeply and love him more deeply, knowing what his plan is for this world and working in a way that's in line with that. I'm praying that they would love people more deeply as well. And I hope that they'll pray and I pray for you as a church that your love will abound more and more. But a church that loves in this way is not just a nice place to visit. It's not just welcoming and friendly like the golf club. It is concerned for God's eternal purposes. It's focused on his mission. And so like Paul, I want to encourage you to link arms with one another as partners in the gospel here in Willowfield, link arms together and fight for one another and fight alongside one another, not against the world, but for the world, that they might come to know Jesus as our Savior and all for God's glory. Let me pray for us. Our Father, we thank you so much this morning for the grace in which we all share, for the gift of your Son, Jesus, who came and died to save us from our sins. We thank you for those with whom we are partners in the gospel, both near and far. Please give us the affection of Christ Jesus for one another. And please, would you give us more and more knowledge and discernment and love as we seek to bring the gospel to this community and around the world. And we pray all of these things in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen.